Namaskar, welcome to NDTV. Today you are watching a very, very special interview with Mr. S. Guru Murthy. He needs no introduction, but there are certain introduction you must keep in mind. He is editor of the magazine, iconic magazine, Tughlaq. He is chairman and founder of Vivekanand International Foundation. He is a chartered accountant by profession, by his qualification. And there was a time when if he picks up a balance sheet, a corporate group would actually get very, very nervous. That those were the times. He is a commentator of our times. And one uh, very interesting introduction, not many people would recall. He is an ex-congressman. And he has never joined any other party except Congress party. That was long back during Kamraj days. Sir, thank you for uh, sparing time for us. It is an honor to talk to you. Thank you, Sanjay. I'm happy you are here in Chennai, and I'm meeting you after a long time, long, long time. Yes, sir. So we will talk about Chennai. It becomes very important. Actually, this becomes a real battleground in the big Modi 3.0 plan. Why is he focusing so much on Tamil Nadu? See, Tamil Nadu uh, actually participated uh, in a very significant manner in the freedom movement. The continuation of that was all Tamil Nadu Congress leaders were mostly national leaders. They didn't focus on local politics. That is what gave space to the DMK to capture power in 1967. And Kamraj became old, and Mrs. Gandhi divided the Congress, weakened the Congress, and the Congress was virtually wiped out in 1971. Afterwards, the DMK split. And the split in the DMK did not help the Congress. It actually took away the Congress votes. The faction led by M.G. Ramachandran, which was capable, which emerged as capable of defeating the DMK, took away the nationalist votes, the anti-DMK votes. And the Congress got weakened even further. So the ADMK emerged as the main uh, opponent of the DMK. And it became a pseudo-nationalist party. And so the ADMK kept on winning, and the DMK became weaker and weaker and weaker. After M.G. Ramachandran also, the situation did not get repaired, except for one election in 1989. When, when the DMK split, when the DMK split, the uh, Kamaraj, uh, the, the Congress thought that this would be an opportunity to emerge, which, is, which was an opportunity. My friend Cho Ramaswamy played a very significant role in that. So, Jayalalitha's uh, faction of the ADMK got 21% votes. Janaki faction got 9% votes. Congress got 20% votes, which is a very significant percentage as compared to what it has been doing so far. But the DMK, which got 29% votes, emerged as the winner. More or less, the similar situation is arising in Tamil Nadu today. Post Jayalalitha and Karunanidhi, both parties, are meandering. They are, they are not in a position to show the vibrancy which used to be there in both the parties. And the ADMK was the, the principal uh, role of ADMK was to oppose the DMK. And the DMK's role was to redefine Tamil Nadu in the Dravidian way, directly, indirectly, said no amount of anti-nationalism, anti-Hindu, anti-North, anti-Brahmin. You know, it had smuggled in these things into what is called the Dravidian ideology. All this Karunanidhi could articulate very well. That he ended with Karunanidhi, and what is now happening is like, you know, many parties are run by families. So this also run by families. So it has run its course. Is there a fatigue about Dravidian politics? Yes. Yes. And why would you say so? You see, Tamil Nadu is perhaps in two ways. In human resource terms, it is probably the best state in the country. And it is perhaps the most Hinduist state. Most people do not know the religious roots of Tamil Nadu are so strong. This was overshadowed by the uh, uh, Dravidian movement in the 1960s and 70s. At that time, the society had also turned some kind of non-believing society. But the society has become completely a believing society. And politics does not know how to handle a believing society. And that's why the DMK is uh, flabbergasted. So DMK is in a huge ideological confusion. So this is the time that uh, BJP entered here. And there was also a provocation for them. Narendra Modi is not a man who will take 
go back modi slogan <laughs> which emerged in 2018 and 19 so he decided these triggers help him actually correct you provoke narendra modi you are in trouble and he doesn't have a very two month three month or four month plan he has a decade old plan he has he thinks decades ahead so he decided to take on the tamil platform and then he began quoting tamil in united nations in us in australia in malaysia everywhere he went he took tamil nadu did not know how to handle this person and in tamil nadu he went about wearing dhoti and uh, chinese prime minister uh, president he was walking in dhoti and uh, this is something which the dmk could not mm. understand so correct me if i am wrong earlier bjp rss conversation about tamil nadu as dravidian politics put it uh, about uh, hindu hindutva hindi language uh, the modi led bjp is using a different narrative it is bringing xi jinping here uh, getting single out and making a big commentary about it and then uh, starting his first day about adhya temple from tamil nadu and talking about antiquity of tamil nadu the language the history the mother of democracy was tamil nadu in first and second century so this north and south north versus south or north dash south actually is a integration project for him you see for modi tamil nadu emerged as not a political challenge but as an intellectual and cultural challenge there was actually no cultural divide between tamil nadu and north that is where the dmk went wrong they tried to give political interpretation to small small differences between north and south and try to say south is different but the amount of integration that has taken place in the post independence period in terms of people traveling apart from the cultural influence economic influence the kind of for example the kongu uh, uh, people who have risen up as an economic force you know 60 80% of the gdp is generated in the kongu region by six districts and they do financing all over india and they do uh, uh they, they do the lorry business all over the i mean they have become national and as well as they have gone to africa and things like that they have become an international community they are a very powerful community so the economic integration that has taken place and the educational institutions which have brought about this kind of this this is completely beyond the comprehension of the dmk to integrate it into their separatist politics so narendra modi saw all this and then he brought in the kashi tamil link and now he has emerged as a person against whom not a word can be said in tamil nadu as someone who is not from tamil nadu and he is also in a sense dravidian you know the the dravidian states include from gujarat downwards all the states down from uh, vindyas are called dravidas so he is also part of the dravidian stock so now he is emerged as a, as a challenge hmm. so is that the reason when he was gujarat chief minister he was interacting with uh, jayalalitha very regularly you see jayalalitha and uh, uh, modi struck chord because she was basically a cultural hindu and so when she decided to support the shilanyas program in 1990 this is a very very major uh, development mm. from tamil nadu a dravidian chief minister supporting shilanyas of the bjp which is no party with touch with a barge pole mm-hmm. then he identified that there is something deeper in her began relating to her and that's why when modi became chief minister she was perhaps the only chief minister to attend that program because jo he was not a very welcomed chief minister in gujarat at that time <laughs> so they struck chord to that extent there is a connection between the admk mind and modi so there has been a confluence taking place between the bjp and the admk and the admk is a hinduized dmk hmm. so that also helps right. i really want to talk a lot about this election but i think i will save it for later uh, let's uh, focus on some big picture uh, ideas which is why this election is very important at global level it is just not one more election 
and the kind of future Mr. Modi is crafting, there is debate about how democratic he is. So let's begin from this part, because we saw Congress party, you worked during emergency as underground activist, and now uh, we hear this less democracy, more democracy versus unstable government. You have written about it. So I want you uh, to capture your thoughts on that. You see, the idea of uh, people do not know what was emergency. I have experienced emergency. I was underground. In fact, uh, I could not attend uh, my father's shroud because I was underground. I could not eat in my house. So that is the kind of uh, uh, situation that prevailed. It was pitch dark everywhere. So to say that there is some undeclared emergency, no, it means so how illiterate these people are about emergency. Emergency is a constitutional clampdown on all rights. It is not that a strong leader takes a strong position, you call him an autocrat. An autocrat can emerge only when the constitution itself certifies that autocracy. That's what happened during the emergency. Such a situation can never arise in this country because the Janta Party amended the constitution to say, unless there is armed rebellion anywhere, you cannot declare emergency. And even then, you can declare emergency only in the region in which the armed rebellion takes place. Previously, if there was a disturbance, if there was a law and order situation, if there is a massive riot, you could declare emergency all over the country. So that has been completely snuffed out. That situation doesn't arise at all. For some people to say today that there is an emergency, the emergency-like situation, it means scoffing at uh, the constitution, scoffing at uh, the parliament, and even demeaning the Supreme Court, which is supposed to be protecting the constitutional rights of the people. And so this is a, a kind of a debate in which only illiterates can take part. All that I can say is that there is uh, less democracy in India is foolish. There are 5,500 cases under the PMLA Act. Only less than 50 cases have been filed against politicians. Only politicians come and shout before you. All other people who have been caught, who are running away, they are not before you. These are the people, and money have been caught, 350 crores, 200 crores, 150 crores. And all these monies have been caught from who? And they are the people who are coming and saying that there is no democracy and uh, there is so much of autocracy. I think, you know, this uh, hiding behind the idea of democracy to escape PMLA is not a debate on democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to know, what is happening at the global level, the transition of India, I can tell you. You see, you have to go back to 1989, in which I am a party to in a way to bring instability in this country by defeating Rajiv Gandhi on the issue of Bhopal. Afterwards, in the next 10 years till 1998, we had seven prime ministers. Some lasted for months, some lasted for days. This is what did India down. And afterwards, we had coalitions, but not as efficient as one would expect the government of India to be, which resulted in the Forbes magazine writing an article, why China flew and India only grew. They held Indian democracy responsible for that. They said, because of democracy in India, it took 60 years to construct the uh, Narmada Dam. But the Tea Gorges Dam, which sank some 23 cities, 172 towns and some 1,200 villages and 1.2 million people, they constructed in 10 years. Your Narmada Dam affected no city, no town, 123 villages and just about a lack of people. That took 60 years. They said this country can never develop because of democracy. But Narendra Modi felt different because in this very democracy, he had seen Gujarat lifting and growing and becoming a prominent and a global level prominent Gujarat had attained this very democracy. So he must be laughing within himself. He, he knew that it was political instability that cost India. And so when he brought stable government in 2014 by appealing to the people, he addressed 780 rallies. When I met him after uh, he became prime minister, he told me, Guru, one leg did not work. I had to stand on one leg to address 700 rallies. That is the effort he put in, got the mandate, and transformed the country. And he was an untouchable to the world. Every country denied visa to him. He said, I will never apply for visa. They came and gave the visa. And today, what is the position? A man who was declared as a mini Hitler, 
Italian prime minister calls him as the most loved leader. And Bill uh, and uh, Biden. It's called Melody. <laughs> Melody. <laughs> so uh, uh, Biden says that I feel like taking your uh, autograph. And Australian prime minister calls him a boss. You see the shift. The shift is because of India's rise as well as Modi's capability to transform India and himself and to convince the world who was seen as a mini Hitler, as a person who can emerge as a leader of that kind, you know, what kind of capacity, tenacity, and what kind of effort he must have put in. So he transformed himself and transformed India. Two decisions which he took, that India will produce a vaccine. Everybody laughed. We all laughed. We always see who produces the vaccine and who will export it to us and we suffer all the diseases and then get the vaccine. Mm. But he said, I will produce the vaccine. And he produced not one, but two. And he vaccinated 110 crore people. And in America, uh, 1.2 million people died. And for in America, uh, the number of people affected, if it is translated in population ratio. Death per 100 was much, much higher than if the American casualty and American infection is translated in terms of population, India must have had infection of 45 crore people mm. and death of 4.5 crore people. He saved us. Otherwise, we would never have got max, uh, vaccine at all. No country could have produced the kind of vaccine we needed. Second is his decision on, on Ukraine. Mm. He didn't have 10 days to decide. He didn't have 10 hours to decide. Mm. He had maybe a couple of hours to decide. Right. And he, he took a decision to remain neutral, which means supporting Russia, which is the biggest uh, affront you could have caused to the United States. <coughs> and what he did, he didn't mean it only as a political action. He knew that Ukraine war means oil will hit $200. He decided to buy oil from Russia in rupee terms. It not only brought down the very oil threat which could have damaged the global economy and the Indian economy and smashed the Indian economy out of existence after the COVID. Mm. We got Laddu in both hands. Mm. His stature increased. America indirectly threatened the sanctions against India. We kept quiet. Now America needs India. We have friendship with America because, you know, the liberal democracies constitute only 13% of the world's population. Without adding India as 18%, they, may, they are nothing. So they want India. That is why G7 nations are giving special place to Indian <coughs> participation. <coughs> so they need India. And Russia is a friend of India. So the foe of America is a friend of India. And America cannot give up India. They may, their statements against us has no meaning today. So what I'm saying is India has emerged as a player as the only player who can probably avoid a cold war in future. So when you are electing a government this time, a leader this time, you are not electing a leader for India. You are electing a global leader on the Indian soil. This is a major shift. This has never happened in the history of India. Nehru was a leader in his times because of the global effect. But the kind of difficulties, the impediments, the opposition, the uh, kind of... Uh, Calumny Narendra Modi overcame to emerge in this situation. This requires a historic study. Very, very interesting. So currently, many of us are grappling that how do we define ourselves? Uh, what is the ideological mooring of uh, Indians? And some very ordinary uh, observations I want to make. Globalization is a broken project. People say democracy is in recession. And some strong leaders, oblique autocrats, have emerged. So basically, the Western worldview is actually on recession. And those societies and countries who had very strong cultural identity are rediscovering themselves. That is why some of us uh, uh, mid middle pathwalas and the liberals are grappling and not understanding this new change going back to the roots to create a modern nation. You see, uh, in fact, you have to understand the shift in the world 
not only in the western world because we always understand the western world through the world through the western world you know in 1965 what happened in uh, between 65 and 74 what happened in china destroy all the past cultural revolution they destroyed every image every book of confucius now in 2021 xi jinping in the 100th year of the communist party uh, celebrations he said 5000 year culture of china will not only guide us today it will guide us in future also how did communism produce culture or how did confucius emerge out of communism this is the shift in the world and the, you know they are all top down countries india is the only country which is a bottom up first country this is what mahatma gandhi showed the top down congress did not work when he came he went to the ordinary people mobilized the masses made them participate in the freedom movement that was the most democratic freedom movement so in india the ramjan bhoomi movement developed to to bring out the corrupt corruptions and the distortions the west led the political cultural secular thoughts have introduced into this country and the slow shift of the country was seeded i was part of the process at that time you know it in 1980s we were all very much part of the seeding of the ramjan bhoomi movement as the only thing which can u turn india and if you see all the political changes that took place the redefining of the idea of india you will use the word ideology india has had never an ideology ideology means there is an enemy india is the only country which did not have an ideological enemy hinduism is the only religion which does not let's not have a theologically declared enemy we have only a philosophy so we have understood the philosophy of india it's an inclusive philosophy can you ever see so many christians muslims so many people with the differing faiths we have uh, we have at one point we had more gods than the number of people in this country we could coexist only because of philosophy ideology means we have killed each other so that identity is coming back though the recovery of that identity or the reinstatement of it is being projected as uh, some kind of a hostile development that has not clicked it happened in 90 it has not happened in 2019 i think narendra modi has despite the fact that he is being caricatured like this he has struck chord with the ordinary people that he has no enemy you may say if uh, i am human so and so is enemy you may even convince people but i don't think that is clicking so the idea of india consistent with the philosophy of india for thousands of years is now slowly seeping in that is what is happening in tamil nadu also very interesting so coming back to tamil nadu there is one more component to the whole thing which is caste the bjp which was seen as brahmin baniya party is at national level uh, working to become an obc party in tamil nadu this caste factor is very very important and it seems that mr modi led bjp has figured this out <coughs> and they are coming up with a new social uh, coalition in tamil nadu will you describe uh, this in bit bit, bit detail you see <coughs> caste is not just a social institution many people misunderstand it it is a cultural institution and in sense every caste is a religion in itself it has a god it has a way of life it has its own way of celebrating marriage it has its own literature it has its own mathas it has its own mathadipati people do not know this the bjp through the ramjan bhoomi movement and later the sengol it figured out that caste is not just a social institution to be politically used it is not just a social institution to be set up against one another that there is a larger identity which is partly spiritual and partly religious and partly cultural this can be a, a kind of a coalition of castes at that level that has been ignored by the dmk dmk fought against it dmk not only fought against it wanted to destroy it it wanted to keep the caste separate from its cultural roots that is where the castes are now alienating getting alienated from the the culture free dravidian ideology so the castes are now beginning to go back to their roots and that is what narendra modi is doing for example this devendra kula velalar movement which is uh, a scheduled caste mm. and they said we are not uh, they are being uh, distributed in seven eight names they said no we are devendra kula 
we want our name so they went and appeal to ne- uh, modi he said you are devendra i am narendra <laughs> i will get your name change he amended the constitution changed the name the community feels proud their economic status is different their uh, they are not scheduled caste in that sense they said we are not scheduled caste you know what is their next demand we don't want to be part of the scheduled caste they want to come out of it this is what cultural pride can do this modi is figuring out so he is now introducing a new way of approaching tamil nadu politics which has completely made the dravidian approach outdated mm. that's where the bjp is rising to okay so now coming back to tamil nadu the biggest curiosity everyone has that with so much effort what will electorally bjp gain in this lok sabha election you see my feeling is as i told you i am recalling the 1989 uh, assembly election where the dmk won and the dmk lost the dmk will lose all elections afterwards was certified by 1989 election because all other parties put together got some 60% votes the dmk got only 28% votes the dmk won that election because the other parties vote got divided almost the same situation is coming today because the dmk has lost its steam in the last 2 3 years and uh, i wouldn't call it an anti establishment wave there is a huge anti establishment sentiment it is not able to overcome it because it doesn't have a, the capability which we used to see in karunanidhi mm. in the same way we don't have the capability which we used to see in jayalalitha but narendra modi has emerged as some kind of a person who is as much local as he looks as he deals with as he speaks and at the same time national and global so he connects a series of uh, uh, social and uh, intellectual strata of tamil society mm. so there is a new uh, appreciation of the bjp if the bjp gets 15 to 20% votes this time the 1998 where election where the congress got 20% votes which it lost later because it had to enter into alliances and compromise itself and reduce the tamil nadu congress party to zero that situation the bjp was in between 1996 and 2014 hmm. and it gradually was getting out of it and now thanks to admk's decision to move out of the dmk it is a gift to the bjp by the admk to realize its own strength that's where i think principally the two personalities played a great role modi at the uh, national level and anamalai at the local level mm. this is a deadly combination true i so think if they are able to post this kind of uh, voting i don't know about the number of seats they may say that it will get three seats some get four seats but one thing the tugluk may has made an analysis mm. maybe three or four seats the bjp may be in the lead but you know they they distribute lot of money and all that last minute what change will take place we don't know but there are seven seats in which the bjp is number 2 right. that means in 10 seats the bjp is either number 1 or number 2 in 13 seats according to us the bjp is number 3 in no seat the bjp is getting less than 10 11% votes if the bjp posts this kind of electoral performance irrespective of the number of seats it has brought about a turn in tamil nadu politics absolutely so another survey by csds that projects that in this election uh, in south india bjp may touch a uh, vote share 25% that means tamil nadu will be the biggest contributor and kerala also and karnataka you already have a sizable presence there so it may not get you seats this time bjp may not get many seats maybe 3 maybe 4 maybe 5 whatever but vote share will significantly, significantly. increase in double double digit no that indicates the <coughs> trend you know till now there is no break there was no critical mass <coughs> of uh, a party emerging apart from the admk and the dmk this critical mass once the bjp gets in 2026 elections the bjp will play probably the principal role in tamil nadu politics and for which narendra modi's long term strategy the provocation that modi go back and he's uh, installing annamalai as the person and the relative decline of both the dmk and the admk and the admk decision to dissociate from him because of the karnataka defeat not visualizing that the bjp will win in the three <laughs> northern states 
all this culminated to put the BJP in the driver's seat in Tamil Nadu politics. Absolutely. And Tamil Nadu has one more uh, unique feature, which is uh, Tamil Nadu uh, voter, they, uh, people, they crave for the larger than life persona. So post MGR, Jailalita, Karuna Nithi, there is a void. So at larger level, Mr. Modi, and at incubation level, Anna Malai is a great combination. Correct. Another also, Tamil Nadu education-wise, <coughs> in terms of its connectivity all over India, and its role at the global level. Many Tamil people are leading uh, multinational corporations. Absolutely. And they are all educated in ordinary schools here. You know, this is the internal brand of Tamil Nadu, yeah. which is working, which will not be visible to the cephologist. But yeah, but that is a global presence. It's a global presence. And last but not the least, the woman power of 2016 onward, uh, women voters are outnumbering men voters in this uh, election. <coughs> and Modi has a special appeal for women. I don't know how uh, the personality of Modi and the personality of women are two different things, but he has been able to culturally appeal to them, economically make them important, and gives them a role in every one of the schemes which he has devised. You know, in all this, he has put a lot of efforts, and that has connected him to women in a manner in which no leader after so, uh, Indira Gandhi had been able to do. Uh, sir, very fascinating conversation with you. On behalf of our audiences, I want to make a public appeal to you that once a month we must talk. Yes. <laughs> and I have a lot to tell you about what happened between 1975 and how the Indian polity shifted stage by stage by stage to today's stage where India occupies the principal place in the global arena. And this is not known or it is not being discussed in the discourse in India because of... Uh, our concerns with the day-to-day -day things. And TV has contributed no less to the fact that it is interested in the hourly development. Yeah. And we are we have become such, such short-termist in approach. We don't connect to the past and we cannot get to the future. You are so right, sir. So we should actually do a conversation, a series of conversation, because you have been, um, in this whole last four decades, uh, you have been part of a historical twist and turning points of this country in politics, society, culture, and journalism now. So we must talk about it. You know why? It is because I refused to get into politics when I was asked to become a Rajya Sabha member in 1992. It is the Kanchi Mahaswami who told me not to get into politics. <laughs> so that made me relevant in politics even today. Otherwise, after Rajya Sabha team was uh, term was over, nobody would have cared for me. So maybe it is my guru's advice which has kept me relevant even today. I know, and you won't like this, but many people say that without any seat of power, you are one of the most powerful person in India. <laughs> you know, in 1990, Gentleman Magazine rated me as one of the most 50 powerful persons in India. And in 2018, 50 most powerful persons were listed in the India today, in which my name figured. But I don't think in 1990 who were there, except me, anyone else was there. <laughs> <laughs> So this is why if you occupy power, your influence goes with power. If you don't occupy power, maybe your influence loss. <laughs> it, it flushes and uh, thrives, and this is 2024. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you, Sanjay. Lovely to have met you after a long time. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir.